Good morning, and happy Father's Day to all the fathers and surrogate fathers out there. Let us join together in our call to worship. Let us gather together all those whose faith is in the Lord. Even so, take courage. The Lord can use even our small seeds of faith. Entrusted to God, tiny seeds of faith grow into plants of glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And our hymn is number 51, How Great Thou Art.
Let us join together in our prayer of praise. O God, in your infinite wisdom, you have called us to live by faith and given us the promise that if we will give you even the tiniest seed of faith, you will bless it. Thank you, Lord. In Christ we pray. Amen. God is gracious and just, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Therefore, let us join together in our prayer of confession. God of here and there, judge of now and then, though you are beyond our line of sight, we must walk by faith. We believe that you are always aware of us and what we do. We know we are on trial, being tested, our conduct under your scrutiny. We confess that our behavior is neither as good nor as bad as it might be. We are not as ambitious for your acceptance as we might be. As exiles, we are anxious to leave the testing grounds behind us, to live with you beyond all danger of failure. Forgive all badness for the sake of Jesus Christ and the goodness he shares with us. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. We are eager to declare that the Lord is just in whom there is no unrighteousness. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth from the fifth chapter, verses 6 through 10 and verses 14 through 17. This is God's word. 
And Paul writes, So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear to before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each day may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that no one has died for all. Therefore, all have died, and he died for us all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for him. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. May God bless us in the reading and the hearing of his word. Amen. And now our gospel lesson this morning from the fourth chapter of the gospel of Mark. Verses 26 through 34. This is God's word. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces its, of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head, but when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will be used for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Again, may God bless us in the reading and in the hearing of his holy word. Amen. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Well, I don't know how to break it to you, but hamburgers don't grow on trees. A father was telling about his little four-year-old son, Josh, taking him out to McDonald's for dinner one evening for a guy's night out. And as they were eating their hamburgers, Josh asked, Daddy, what are these little things on the hamburger buns? Dad explained that they were tiny seeds and that they were okay to eat. Josh was quiet for a couple of minutes, and his dad could tell he was deep in thought. Finally, Josh looked up and said, Dad... If we go home and plant these seeds in our backyard, we will have enough hamburgers to last forever. Not a bad guess for a four-year-old. However, we know that hamburgers don't come from sesame street seeds. But Josh was sure right about one thing. Tiny seeds can produce a bountiful harvest. Jesus often compared the kingdom of God to seeds sown in the ground. In today's lesson from Mark's gospel, we discover two such parables of the kingdom. The first one reads like this, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, 
He puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Now, remember that this is a parable about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It is God's reign in human life. Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, the day is coming when on this earth, God's love will reign in every heart. At that point, the world will live in peace. There will be no more pain, no more hunger, no more war. The kingdom came into the world with Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, it has been growing ever since. Now notice in this parable that the farmer doesn't plow the seed under, nor does he irrigate it. He simply scatters the seed on the ground. Then, says Jesus, night and day, whether the farmer sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and it grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. All by itself, the earth produces grain and the grain matures in successive stages and the soil does this automatically. In the Greek translation, scholars tell us a better rendering would be that the seed does this without visible cause or without human agency. This is to say that the kingdom is God's work. God is responsible for the outcome. Note this, the kingdom of God is coming. With or without our help, it is coming. Hitler couldn't stop it. Communism couldn't stop it. ISIS cannot stop it. This is the amazing thing about seed. It will often grow with or without our help. Not only that, it will often grow with great abundance. A certain gardener decided to count the seed pods on a medium-sized mustard plant. There were 85. The average number of seeds in each pod was eight. Since two crops in a given year could be matured, this gardener figured that it was possible in the interim between February and mid-October to produce a yield of 462,000 seeds, all from one original plant. Uh, here's what's amazing. Many other species of plants far exceed that increase. Nature is bountiful beyond all imagining. The kingdom of God is like that. We may not see it. It may be hidden by the maddening follies of humanity. That doesn't mean it does not work. I like John Bokema's analogy of this century plant. The century plant is native to the desert regions. It's so named because it is notoriously a slow grower. For decades, the century plant will show no signs of growth. It'll look just like a scrubby, ugly little bush then one day it will suddenly start growing. It may grow half a foot per day and reach up to 40 feet tall. And after it's reached its full growth, the century plant suddenly produces flowers. Its bright yellow blossoms last for weeks at a time. It's a spectacular sight for anyone who has the patience to watch for it. The kingdom of God is like that. We may not see any signs of it at work, but suddenly, without warning, God does a wondrous new work, and we look with delight at what God has done. Jesus, of course, uses the analogy of the mustard seed in our second parable. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth, Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. The common black mustard seed was the smallest of all the seeds sown in the fields of Palestine. It took about 760 mustard seeds to weigh one gram. How small is one gram? Well, it takes 28 grams to equal one ounce. That's how small mustard seeds are. But growing from such a small seed, the mustard shrub becomes the largest of all garden plants. It reaches heights of 12 to 15 feet in just a few weeks. 
the parable highlights the insignificant beginning of God's kingdom embodied in Jesus. Born in an obscure village of peasant parents, working until he was 30 in a carpenter shop, gathering around him a motley crew of men and women, most of whom were drawn from the lower tiers of society in wealth and prestige, and yet like that insignificant little seed, quickly outgrows all the other plants in the garden, so too will the kingdom of God. It'll surpass all the earth's kingdoms in power and in glory. So what can we learn from these two parables? Well, first of all, we learn that God works through small, insignificant acts of life to build his kingdom. That's because one small act often leads to another, and then to another, and so on. Let me give you an example of that. Do you know the name Rick Razamenti? Neither did I. Not too long ago, Rick Razamenti, a native of Riverside, California, made the news with a radical act of kindness for a stranger. Rick gave one of his kidneys to someone he didn't even know. Now, you might... You and I might donate a kidney for a family member, but even for, maybe for a good friend, but a complete stranger? Rick was inspired by a friend who had donated a kidney to, to help someone, and Rick's kidney ended up in a man in Livingston, New Jersey. Well, what makes this story more wonderful is that Rick's act started a chain of donations. The niece of the man who received Rick's kidney made a donation, giving one of her kidneys to a stranger, and so on and so forth. Within a relatively short time, 30 people had received kidneys as a result of the chain of giving set off by Rick's act. Donald Terry, a man in Joliet, Illinois, was the most recent recipient. He was expecting to have to wait five years or more for a transplant. With some 67,000 people dying every year from kidney failure in the United States, the need for transplant donors is great. Rick Rizamenti is a matter of fact about his gift. According to the website which reported his story, he said, People think it's odd that I'm donating a kidney. I think it's so odd that they think it's so odd. <laughs> Whether he knows it or not, Rick planted a seed for the kingdom of God when he donated a kidney to a stranger. Anytime one human being does a loving act for another human being, the kingdom comes closer. It is even more obvious when a follower of Christ performs such an act in his name, and what a witness that is. Just a few years ago, Richard Litcher wrote a book called Open Secrets. It's about his first year of ministry. Fresh out of divinity school and full of enthusiasm, Lesher found himself assigned to a small conservative church in an economically depressed town in southern Illinois. This was far from what this overly enthusiastic, optimistic young man expected. The town was bleak, poor, and clearly not a step on the path to a brilliant career. It was an awkward marriage at best. A young man with a PhD in theology, full of ideas and ambitions, determined to improve his parish and bring them into the 21st century. Often he doesn't understand his congregation, and sometimes they don't understand him either. It's only later that Litcher begins to see what he couldn't see while he was striving to be the perfect pastor of this conservative con congregation. The kingdom of God was happening in that small parish, even though he was blind to it. He asked the question, why couldn't I see the kingdom of God happening in our little church? People in our congregation, every week, volunteered to exercise the legs of a little girl with cerebral palsy so that her muscles wouldn't grow weak. People helped one another put up hay before the rains came. When a neighbor lost their farm, we all grieved with him and we refused to bid on his tools when they came to auction. Weren't these all signs of the kingdom of God? Lisher asked. Why couldn't I see them? 
Those were signs of the kingdom. Every act of kindness to a neighbor or to a stranger, every effort, no matter how small, to improve our world, every act of witness to the presence of God in our world is used by God as a building block for God's kingdom. There are three simple truths that we need to take away when we leave worship today from these two parables of Jesus. The first is that God is at work in this world. I like the way Megan Feldmeyer put it in an address from Duke University Chapel some time back. Feldmeyer reminded her audience of the Bette Midler song, From a Distance, which she recorded in the early 1990s. Well, it won her a Grammy. The song talks about from a distance the world looks blue and green and the snow-capped mountains are white. And from a distance there's a harmony and no guns or bombs or disease. And God is watching us from a distance. You remember that song, any of you? I didn't. Feldmeyer notes that this song is so lovely with its images of peace and harmony that you almost find yourself believing it. That is until you realize that it is totally false. Heresy. Theological rubbish. The parable of the mustard seed tells us that God is not watching us from a distance. God is not some pie in the sky who looks down and glosses over the suffering and who doesn't deal in the reality of our lives. The God of the mustard seed is a God who comes to earth to be among us. Remember Christmas time? Emmanuel? God with us. He reduces himself to the scant, insignificant life of a poor carpenter who enters into the dirt and mud and pain and suffering and who gently but persistently cracks open new life. If you were to pick up a handful of dirt and soil, the mustard seed is so small you probably couldn't even find it in that. It's hidden out of sight and hard to find even if you're looking. But it doesn't mean it isn't there. The mustard seed awaits concealed, invisible, until the time is ripe to unleash its mighty rebirth. Just because we can't see the mustard seed doesn't mean the mustard seed isn't there. In the same way, our inability to see, to affect God's, our inability to see doesn't affect God's ability to be. And God is always for us. I like that. Our inability to see doesn't affect God's ability to be. The second thing we need to see is this. The attitude of the believer should always be one of hopefulness. So many people are being stirred to despair this day by the constant barrage of bad news carried primarily by the cable news networks. Just remember, these networks have a tremendous amount of time to fill Bad news always sells. And since in any portion of the world you can find something disturbing going on, it may seem to the undiscerning viewer that the whole world is coming apart. It's not. The truth is that there is less bad news in the world than ever before. People are living longer. Less people are living in poverty. And on the whole, the world is more peaceful than it ever has been. Even the most large cities of the U.S., the streets are, by and by, safer to walk than they were a few decades ago. That doesn't mean that there won't be general crises from time to time. But the truest words of any song ever written are these, This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. God is at work in the world. The attitude of the believer should always be hopefulness, not because of what human beings may do, but because God's plan for the world. The kingdom of God is coming. God will prevail. This brings us to the final thing to be said. Let's make certain we are on the winning side. We certainly don't want to be standing in God's way when his kingdom comes. We want to be on the side of hope Peace, love, healing, and faith. Some of you will remember when the NFL's Seattle Seahawks played their games in the dome stadium known as the King Dome. 
A noted Washington state pastor of that era, Dr. Joe Harding, shared a conversation he once heard on a radio station that was describing a play-by-play -play action of a game being played in the kingdom. The battles between the Seattle Seahawks and the New Orleans Saints. It was late in the fourth quarter. It looked like the Seahawks were going to win. However, the Saints got one more chance. A few plays were successful. Anticipation was growing. The announcer said, the Saints are marching down the field. The Saints are playing together. It now looks like the Saints are going to win in the kingdom. And that is one of the few things you can count on in this turbulent world. God is winning. The saints of God are winning. The only way you can be certain you are on the winning side is to be faithful in serving God and in serving humanity. Like seeds planted in the ground, even if it's as tiny as a mustard seed, the kingdom will spring forth eventually as a blessing to all. Nancy DeMoss, writing on The Law of the Harvest, put it this way, For better or for worse, most of the patterns in my life today are the fruit of choices I made years ago. The books I read, the people I spent time with, the way I responded to authority, the way I spent my free time, my study habits, all these things affect me now. In the same way, the choices we make today will affect us down the road. Every sinful, selfish, or indulgent act is sowing a seed that will reap a multitude of harvest. Every act of obedience is also a seed that will bless us and those around us. God is at work in the world. The attitude of the believer should always be hopefulness, not because of what human beings may do, but because of God's plan for the world, God will prevail. Let's make certain we're on the winning side. Amen. Now let us turn to hymn number 422, Amazing Grace. You may remain seated.
As we come to a time of prayer together, let us join our hearts in prayer before the Lord. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we count it such a blessing to be able to come together in this place to join our hearts and minds in prayer. We ask, O oh God, that you would send your Spirit to be with us so that our prayers might be according to your will and not just our own. We lift up our prayers for the nations of the world, for their leaders. We know that Scripture proclaims that you have placed those leaders in positions of authority. And so we ask that their lives might be touched, that they might learn from your truth and your justice, your peace and your love. We pray especially for this great nation and for her leaders. And we pray, O oh God, for those who protect and serve us both at home and abroad. We pray for their safety and their quick return home. We pray for our community, for family and friends, for those who are yet strangers. We ask, O oh God, that you would use the likes of us, that you would open our eyes and outstretch our arms to those whose needs are so much greater than our own, and that in doing that, they might see you at work in this world. We remember before you all fathers, We remember the stories in the Bible about the great fathers of our faith. And we remember our own fathers. And we pray, O oh God, that you would bless their memories and bless those of us who are still here, that we might be good fathers to our children, whoever they may be. We lift up our prayers for those who might be living with illness or disease, with loneliness or despair. We know that you are the God of all healing. And for those who are waiting to go to a doctor, for those who have been and heard whatever news, for those who are undergoing treatments of various sorts, we ask, O oh God, that you would bring healing and wholeness, but most of all, hope that you are the God of all creation, a God who watches over us and cares for us, a God who loves us unconditionally. We pray for those who grieve and who mourn over the loss of loved ones, we ask, O oh God, that you would spread your arms of comfort around them, that they might feel your presence and remember that there is life beyond life in this world. Increase our faith like a little seed and help us to grow into your loving children. We give you thanks most of all for the gift of your son, Jesus the Christ, born as a little tiny baby who grew, who began to teach and then heal and then called disciples unto himself. They marveled at how he prayed. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray like you pray. And he said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let us now turn to hymn number 363, and if you're able, stand and join in singing, To God Be the Glory.
go in peace. And may the love of God uphold us, the mercy of God sustain us, and the word of God direct us. And may the Lord bless you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.